uh, there's a couple things I'd like to share about the pictures. Uh, first of all, this is the only decent picture I've ever found with a harlot riding the seven-headed dragon. Um, I'm going to go back. This is also the only picture of the papacy from Revelation 13 that I found is actually theologically accurate. You'll notice what makes it theologically accurate is that all 10 horns are on one head. They're not, you know, the other pictures, they got the horns sprinkled all over the other heads. There's no, if you look at Daniel, the lion come, the lion has one head. There's no, there's no, no horns on his head. Then there's the bear. There's no horn on his heads. And then there's the leopard has four heads and there's no horns on their heads. And then the last piece is a dragon and all 10 horns are on the seven, on the, the head of the dragon or the beast, seventh, seven head, which is the beast. So this person obviously was paying attention to the theology when he drew the picture and you have a leopard-like beast, you see the leopard, with the feet of a bear and the heads of a lion, but then you'll notice that all ten horns are on one head. See, that's theologically correct, because the ten horns deal with the ten kings that are going to reign with the harlot for one hour at the end. Um, so anyways, I just, I was glad to find that picture finally. I was going to draw my own, but I'm glad I didn't have to. They did a good job. I, any questions, comments at first, where you'd like to go with this? And then uh, if not, I'll just take it wherever you're. Any Hi, questions? Pastor. Hey, Craig, how are we doing? I'm blessed by God's grace. Um, uh, 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 I love your presentation. Praise the Lord. Um, the one thing I would say is I'm, I'm a little uncomfortable with saying that the, the fifth and sixth trumpet have nothing to do with Islam, at least historically they did. You know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm okay with the idea, with the possibility that there's an antitypical fulfillment in our time that might have something to do, for instance, with the King of the South, like you're talking about, the beast from the bottomless pit. But, uh, you know, they, the, the historical, typical fulfillment that we've taught and that the pioneers taught and then they, you know, they put on their prophetic charts, you know, it, it, it both fit with the history and was, you know, seems to be endorsed in Sister White's writings. So, I well, mean, the, yeah. the hour, the day, the month, and the year in particular that, that William uh, Litch, uh, Josiah Litch, um, you know, predicted the fall of the Ottoman Empire and it gave, gave a great impetus to the early Advent movement in their prophetic interpretation. And to now say that that prophetic interpretation was wrong, I'm uncomfortable with that. Okay, well, thanks for that. I appreciate that sensitivity. I know that uh, you, you're, you're correct in saying she seems to support it. Uh, actually, she doesn't give a whole lot of support to it. She does say that it, that it gave great impetus to the founders in terms of their prophetic interpretation. That's true. Um, yeah, but she never states it was an accurate an accurate prophetic delineation. But I, I, I appreciate what you're sharing. The, the problem is the point is, is that it, when you study the fifth trumpet, you, uh, that's actually an exodus from an Egypt experience. And, and, and of course, when you begin to understand the king of the north and the king of the south, you begin to realize that the king of the north and the king of the south are different mindsets, even within the same cultures. So, for example, Islam has a king of the north and Islam has a king of the south. Mm -hmm. so if you look at the, the Sunnis are the king of the south, they're the secular ones. And the Shias, the Shias are the king of the north. They're the, the religious fanatics who want to take government to, to push their religious agenda. So even with Islam, you have a king of the north and a king of the south. So the, so the problem that I have with the interpretation is that when you, when you start saying that Islam is the king of the south, then you're missing, you're missing the whole point. It's the same thing within Adventism. You see, you see a liberal, a, a liberal progressive position by people that we would say that's the king of the south. That's the secular humanist idea of you know taking all these social ideas and bringing them into Adventism. And then you you also have this Pharisaic idea of of you know we're right and we need to push an agenda and force other people like the Pharisees to follow us. So even within Adventism, you have this you have this mindset of the north and you have the mindset of the south. So every yeah. culture, every nation, every group of people has this dichotomy of the king of the north and the king of the south. And that's where I'm making the statement about being wrong is that if I, you see, I can't say like the turkey is the king of the north. There's people within Turkey that are on the, the side of the south or, you know, so you understand what I'm saying.
Yes. So what I'm saying is that there, there needs to be more of a specific understanding of the philosophies and the, and, and the theologies and the ideologies that are being generated from those, from those philosophical worldview positions that determine whether someone is the king of the, south, king of the north or the king of the south. See, Jesus faced this in his day. See, the Sadducees, the Sadducees were humanists. They yes. were based on Greek philosophy. That's the king of the south. And they're actually ruling over God's people. And then the Pharisees, the Pharisees were the ones that were pushing the agenda, and they wanted Herod and the laws to push their Pharisaical agenda. They were, they were the king of the north. And so, so Jesus knew who he was talking to and how to talk to them because he knew the, philo the, the philosophical mindset that was behind them. And that's the point that I'm trying to make. When we go through the prophecies, the prophecies are very clear to delineate which kind of mindset you're, you're dealing with when you're dealing with them. And actually, when you get into the seven trumpets, you're actually dealing with judgment for, the, for Christendom. And what's happened is that all of Christendom is actually coming under the umbrella of the king of the south. And the seven trumpets are actually patterned after the, the, the coming out of Egypt because Christendom is, needs to be called out of Egypt. That's where they need to be called out of. And for, by the way, that's going to become a pattern for the seven last plagues. So the trumpets are set in the context of calling God's people out of Egypt. And that, yeah. that the king of the south is the, is, the, is the issue there. Again, it's not the king of the north. Yes, and I, I've seen, and we've talked about before, how, you know, depending on where you're reading about Assyria in the scriptures, you can be a king of the north or king of the south power. That's right. Because, you see, and see, that's part of the secret, is that every Every group starts, they start, they start as mystics. Yes. And they start as the king, of, they start with the king of the north philosophy. And then they go, they, they rise from that, from that philosophy to a golden age. And then what, what happens is that the, the generation, the generations that come later begin to question the founders. And they start asking all these questions and, and doubting all the, the basic philosophies that were governed the, to govern the growth of that empire and that empire begins to fall apart. And that's the, so that as begins to fall apart, that's the king of the south. Every empire starts as the king of the north, king of the north or northern philosophy. And then it, when it, when it ends, it deteriorates and falls apart, it's the king of the south. See, the king yeah. of the south philosophy is, there's no unity there. So in the king of the south philosophy, because it's, the king of the south philosophy is the maturing of Satan's philosophy. So the idea is when Satan says, well, I'm God, then he convinces the other, all the other angels that they're God. Well, then if everybody believes that they're God and they're right, then there's no unity. Everybody's fighting against everybody else thinking that they're right. And so there's no unity in the king of the south. They have to have a common enemy. And that's where Christ and, and of course, God's people become the common enemy that unify the king of the north and the king of the south and actually unify the king of the south. Does that make sense? You see the same thing going on in our day, right? Um, I don't want to jump to modern events, but Putin, you know, Putin is the is the leader of Russia, and we usually see Russia as communists, and so we see them as the king of the south. But the truth is, is that Putin's ideas, you know, Putin doesn't support the LBTQ movement, and he doesn't support all this gender stuff, and he doesn't support all that stuff. He he's a very he's a conservative. Actually, a conservative. So you have you have the people from the King of the South in in the United States who are pushing all this King of the South mess, and and you have someone who's who's a, comes from a communist country, and he doesn't agree with them. He doesn't support that. He said he he knows that that ru that ruins society, it tears society apart. So you so you have people supposedly with the same ideology that don't agree with each other. Yes, and paradoxically, you know the you know the the communists during the Cold War promoted that king of the south mindset and philosophy in america because they knew it would undermine america <laughs> even though they themselves don't believe it and follow it <laughs> right james so in that line of thinking so the laodicean church would be tied to the king of the south in some respects absolutely see that's the that's see that's the part of the problem see, Thank you. That's one of the, see, lay, the king of the south is materialist, all right? They're also a secular humanist. They, so they're, they're, 
the king of the south are into materialism, but they're also into, into in, as you see in Jesus' day, money talks, right? Because money is power. So, so when God talks to Laodicea, first of all, he talks to them because they're rich and increased with goods. They're materialists. They're in, they're, they're, you know you're in Egypt if, if things are more important than people, right? So Pharaoh, you know, he killed people to build pyramids. He didn't care about the people. He just wanted a pyramid because he wanted to, his own glory, right? So Laodicea is the same way. Laodicea cares about stuff more than they care about people. They're rich and increased with goods and don't think they have any need, right? But so, so when God describes the gospel to them, he describes it to them in terms of money. And he has to because, because the king of the south, materialists, they, 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 they're into wealth and riches. But it's not because, because of, of riches. It's because money brings power. And power is what they're interested in. The king of the south is interested in power. That's why they're not, truth doesn't matter to them. Uh, information can be twisted. There's, there's no such thing as absolute truth. There's relative, if everything's relative. And the, you, you take facts and you twist it, whatever you want it to be, so that you, you're right and you have power and you can push your agenda. So that's the king of the south. And that's, that's what Laodicea has bought me into. That's, that's, why we're, that's why they're Laodicean. Which, which is the point here is that God's people are under the philosophy. They've been actually indoctrinated in the philosophies of the king of the south, which is why they're not, God, they're not doing God's, God's work. They're lukewarm. And they're, they're following the ways of the world. And they say they're anxious for Jesus to come, but they're more interested in, 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 their, in, their, in money and in their stuff. And it's also, sadly enough, you can see that when the leaders of the church start making decisions based on money rather than based on biblical principles, then you know that the church is following the king of the south. So when the insurance company who runs, who backs the, the, the Adventist church starts determining our, our, our doctrine and our teaching and our position on things because, because it's a financial decision and it's not a biblical decision, then you know that we're, 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 we're the Sadducees, we're the king of the south. And, and that's exactly where we are, right? Don, Sue. Yeah, so, you know, in, es in essence, the king of the north and king of the south, they're both power hungry. They just go about it in different ways. They have different philosophies toward the same end. Right. Right. So one, one accepts, one accepts that there's God, but rejects his law. The other accepts there's laws, but they, they reject that there's God. So that's why, that, that's why it's the two ditches, right? Because those are the only two options available for Satan to have to, for his false philosophy. Because the truth is that there's, there's the law of God and it's, it's God's law. So when you have God and you have his law, then you have both aspects, the, right? The word of God and the testimony of Jesus, or they keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. So to not, to reject any one of those, to reject his law, but claim there's God, then you're a mystic and you're making reality whatever you want it to be. And then, but to claim that there's, there's law, but there's no God, well, now you're, now you're a king of the South, you're, you're a secular humanist, you're an atheist. You, you study science because it's based on law, but you don't acknowledge as a God behind it so both of those philosophies are a twisting or a twisting of faith they're not functioning in faith and satan of course wants power by any means possible he wants to sit above the congregation of the north you know on the sides of the north and and be like god and he doesn't care how he gets it <laughs> right well see the thing is is that see he went through the same pro process see he he at first was a mystic he believed, he knew that the God existed, but he, he questioned his law, right? So, but then when he was proved wrong, the, 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 end, the end result of his philosophy led him to the place where he actually believes that he's God, that he, he ends up coming to the place where he's God. Well, if he's God, then all creatures are God. No, all creation is God, and, and there, therefore there can be no one God, right? So he ends up in this, in this pantheistic, atheistic, humanistic, you know, creaturism stuff which is the maturing of his philosophy, which, which is important because this is why the dragon in the Bible has seven heads. The dragon is always the maturing of the philosophy of evil. And so the seven-headed dragon is always Satan or it's, it's, it's atheism or humanism, creaturism. And there's seven heads because 
because seven is the full number. So the idea is that all the different ideas that could possibly exist are all these creatures who think they're God, it covers all that, right? Whereas the king of the north, the, the mystics, they're, they're, re, they're religious people. So they believe there's a God. They just, they just make void God's law so then they can make whatever law they want to fill the void. So yes, so the Bible describes this process from the beginning that you start out as a mystic and then you end up as a, as a materialist. Uh, and then, of course, when that happens, everything falls apart and then the cycle starts again. And that's why you have all these kingdoms, one kingdom after another kingdom, or different ages, age to age. Now, what's important, along with Jim, Jim's point here, is that Laodicea, Laodicea is under the influence of, and actually has been conquered by the king of the south. They believe the king of the south at worldviews. This, this is the same thing, the same thing that happened at the first coming price, as I mentioned. Um, the Jews that came out of uh, Babylonian captivity and out of Persian captivity to build the temple became under Greek influence and they started beginning they started to adopt the Greek idea Greek ideas of humanism into their thinking into their philosophy of course this is why the Old Testament is actually translated into the Septuagint and a lot of people have a lot of trouble with a lot of the things in Septuagint because it's not accurate but what happens is is that Greek, the, the Jews adopt uh, Greek thinking humanism into their into their thinking, and, and this is what sets them up to reject the Messiah. Um, and so, so Satan was planting the seeds that would come to fruition, and it would stop them, would uh, actually um, block them from reject, uh, accepting the Messiah. If you look in Revelation 11, Revelation 11 attributes the crucifixion of Christ to the King of the South, to, to this uh, secular humanism. Um, he literally says in Revelation 11, uh, spiritually, there's, there's Sodom and Egypt, where also the Lord is crucified. So um, it was the secular humanist atheist philosophies, humanistic philosophies, that got them to uh, reject Christ and crucified him, which is very significant. So God's people are, are always found to be part of the king of the south when this end thing happens. Now, let me share with you... Um, the first place the Lord showed me this a long time ago, but it's, the, it's not the first place in the Bible, but it's the first place God showed it to me. It was in Genesis chapter 12. It's the story of Abraham. And of course, you know, if you remember the story, that's, that Abraham comes out of Ur of Chaldees. So Abraham is actually part of Babylonian thought. He comes out of the Ur of Chaldees, which is Babylon, and God calls him out. Um, so in chapter 12, before chapter 12 is over, there's a famine in the land. I mean, where does, where does, where does Abraham go? Of course, his name's Abram. Where does he go? Well, he, well, he goes yeah. to Egypt. Now, so here's this man of faith who would never bow down to an idol, but when he's confronted with, with losing his life because his wife is pretty, then what does he do? Well, he comes up with this little lie that, oh, just tell them you're my sister and they won't kill me, right? Of course, it's a half truth, but of course, a half truth is really a lie. And so, so what happens is he, when he goes to Egypt, then, then this whole thing happens with Sarah. Of course, it's interesting. King of the South, Egypt. This the the whole woman thing is going to become significant throughout the Bible. But anyway, so here's the story of Abram. And remember, Pharaoh goes to take her as his wife because she's beautiful, and that's when all the problems start, right? And God steps in and clarifies the issue, and then and then. Of course, Abraham becomes very rich, and that's important. Abraham becomes very rich when he's in Egypt, and when he leaves Egypt, he leaves a very rich person, and he leaves with his wife. God protected him, but he becomes rich. Now, right after that story in, in Genesis 13, you have the story of Lot, and, and Lot is, is talking to Abraham and saying, well, we, we can't hang out together because we can't figure out whose sheep is whose sheep. Because Lot, so Lot is really interested in, in wealth and, and, and everything else, right? So then Abraham, Abram, even though he's older and should have had taken charge, he, he graciously allows Lot to make his own choice. And what does Lot choose? Well, Lot chooses to go to Sodom. Well, it's very important. Remember in Revelation 11, 
uh, Sodom and Egypt, spiritually, the city that's called spiritually called Sodom and Egypt. Sodom is Egypt. Sodom and Egypt are the same thing. It's, it's the same philosophy. Sodom is actually the maturing of the philosophy of Egypt. That's why uh, there's no law. There's total, uh, you know, idolatry there because there's no standard for truth. So Lot goes to Sodom, right? And, uh, of course, everything seems to be fine at first. But then Genesis tells us a story about five kings from the north are coming to fight against four kings from the south. Remember? So the kings of the north come to fight against the kings of the south. And Ketelamar is the head of the king of the north. And he's coming south to fight against the kings of the south. And what happens is the king of the north conquers the king of the south. But who happens to be living in the south? Lot, which is God's people, right? So what happens to Lot? Well, he's taken captive by the kings of the north. Why is he taken captive by the kings? Because he's part of the king of the south. That's why, right? He's not supposed to be there, but he is there. And so, so Abraham, of course, the story comes that Abraham becomes the redeemer. He plays the role of Christ here, and he actually delivers a lot from, from captivity from, from, the king of, from the king of the north, and he sets him free. And, of course, this is when Melchizedek shows up, and, there's, of course, this is, typology is beautiful. This is actually a prophecy of the end as well. So, so here you see the story of the king of the north fighting against the king of the south, and God's people represented by Lot. Are, are in the wrong place. They're under the king of the south and they're taken captive. Now, the strange thing about the story is that even though, even though this happens, Lot doesn't learn. Of course, it's not actually Lot deciding to live in Sodom. Who's the one deciding to live in Sodom? His wife, yes. So the king of the south is always connected to women and women's agendas, okay? That's part of the king of the south, right? So so Lot is living in Sodom, actually, because he doesn't have a backbone enough to stand up to his wife and say, no, we're not living here. And remember when the, the three angels come to Abram, and then God talks to Abram about what he's going to do. He goes to Sodom. Well, then, of course, you know, they go to Sodom, and then the whole story of, what, of Lot and Sodom take place. And then Lot finally gets dragged out by the angel with his two daughters, remember, and what happens to his wife? Well, she turns to salt because her heart is still in Sodom, right? So in her heart, she, that's where she is. And then, and then this, this strange story happens with Lot and his two daughters, right? What's strange about that story? That his daughters actually, actually get their father drunk and sleep with him and become pregnant because they tell him, oh, no, it's the end of the world, and there's no other man on the planet, so I have to do this to my father, which is insanity, right? But, of course, where did they learn, where did they learn to treat their father like this? In Sodom. In Sodom, from their mom, right? So, so by the way, this is, this is significant because in Daniel 11, this still needs to be worked out, by the way, but I'll tell you ahead of time. In Daniel 11, when the king of the north conquers the king of the south, there's three groups of people that he says are not that escape. In verse 41, he shall enter into the glorious land, Daniel 11, and many countries shall be overthrown. But these shall escape out of his hand, even Edom, Moab, and the chief children of Ammon. So... So who are these people? Descendants of Lot. Well, that's right. Ammon and Moab are the, the, the sons, the sons of the, the son of the eldest daughter of Lot. She calls him Moab, and then the, the son of the, the, the younger daughter is called Ammon. So that's the, the two shape. And the other one is Edom. But you'll notice, you'll notice that these. These three names are connected to the king. They're connected to the king of the south. But when the king of the south is conquered, they're not conquered. They escape, which is very interesting. And there's there's a whole theological study that needs to be done on that. Um, so they're connected to the south, but they're not conquered when this king of the south is conquered. So that's that's also very interesting. But the point 
back to the Genesis story is the point of Genesis is being very made very clear that Abraham comes out of Babylon, then Babel, then Abraham goes to Egypt and Abraham, Abraham has to come out of Egypt. All right. Now, when it comes to Isaac, Abraham is very, very stern about when he sends his servant to find a wife for his son, what he tells his servant what? No matter what, do not let Isaac go back there. Go back where? To 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 the north, to the to to Irv Chaldees. He doesn't go there, right? So so he actually sends his servant to get find Rebecca. So he Abraham doesn't want his son going up there. By the way, Isaac Isaac has trouble with Abimelech, but Isaac never goes to Egypt either. So Isaac learned from the from his father. Now his son Jacob is not going to have the same issues. I mean, and then of course Jacob and his son Joseph, they're going to go north and then they're going to come back and they're going to end up in Egypt. So the same thing happens. This king of the north, king of the south, king of the north thing takes place. So the point here is that is that what the prophecy says is that God's people are found under the mindset or under the captivity of the king of the south when the king of the north comes. And because they're under the king of the north, that's when the, that's why they're captured. That's where they're taken captive. And that's what's going on in Daniel 1. Uh, 1 and that's also what's going on in Daniel chapter 11. Also what's going on right now among God's well, yeah, <laughs> Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that, that's right. What's going Mercy. on right now. Yeah.